Hello, I'm Lamar County resident Gary Grubbs. You know in today's world, Doppler radar, satellite pictures, and weather spotters help forecasters give us advance notice of the possibility of tornadoes. Warnings by the media, emergency management, and sirens let us know of an approaching tornado. But a century ago, on April 24th, 1908, in the bustling town of Purvis, Mississippi, not a one of a nearly thousand souls living in that area had more than a few minutes warning of the event that was about to change their lives forever. At 2.13 that day, Purvis was almost completely wiped off the map by what is still categorized as the seventh deadliest tornado in American history. Listen now as Jackson Walker takes us back to that fateful day. Highland Brothers Mercantile and the Dearman Drug Stores on Front Street across the railroad from the train depot were flush with customers that spring afternoon, while across Ohio Avenue a dozen hardened sawmill workers labored in the hand sawmill number two. The proud steam whistle of the overburdened Shea steam locomotive signaled its approach to the mill from the east woods, while bankers, lawyers, and timber speculators gathered at the majestic courthouse on Main Street. The talk of the town that afternoon was of the pride that was shared by everyone in the graduation ceremony that had been completed shortly after noon that very day. The ten young seniors that graduated would present literary and musical performances that evening, and most of the town planned to attend. Stepping out of the commencement exercise at the high school, a few of the old-timers noticed ominous signs on the southwestern horizon, for the weather had indeed changed abruptly within the past hour. The birds had stopped singing, and the bees' hum had grown silent. Casually at first, the main topic of conversation among them switched to whether the skies would bring a much-needed rain for planting season, or whether it could be something not so welcome, such as a storm. In their speculations, none of them could have imagined how the next few minutes would change their lives forever. I was in an open space and watched two or three small funnel-shaped formations. They gathered in the southwest and apparently from three quarters of a mile out of town. There the three formations seemed to me to pass into one. It grew very dark. The tornado moved swiftly and with a terrible roar. I would judge that it could have been heard for miles up the road. I stood in this open space and watched it come. I had not long to wait because the next minute it seemed to me that I was picked up bodily and slammed through a door in the pilot's door. Yes, I went in a hurry. Yes, I've heard some people say that the cyclone stood over the town for some minutes, but they are mistaken. It came in a hurry and passed the same way. I should judge the whole business was over in about three minutes. This is the verdict of several people with whom I've conversed since the storm passed. It all looked like a big black balloon to me. C.M. Cromwell, who happened to be passing through Purvis that very April afternoon, had no way of knowing that what he had just witnessed was the heart of the seventh deadliest cyclone in recorded American history, and that it was only about halfway through its 200-mile journey across parts of three states, beginning near Denham Springs, Louisiana, and giving out somewhere east of Waynesboro, Mississippi, in Alabama. He must have hoped, however, that it was not worse anywhere more than in Purvis, for the scene that he had witnessed would prove to be ground zero of the awful, monstrous storm. The primitive communication lines of the city of Purvis were destroyed, as was everything within a three-quarter mile swath of destruction. From the courthouse east along Ohio Avenue, the boarding houses and dwellings of the town's families made from virgin longleaf yellow pine lumber were scrambled like matchsticks. Outside of town on the logging railroads and dummy lines in the woods, entire logging camps and farming communities vanished forever with the wind. If help was to come, it would have to be back and far in person, for communication with the outside world had been suspended. W.B. Allsworth and J.C. Calhoun were sent for help on horseback one by one in case either could not navigate the narrow roads and three creeks between Purvis and Hattiesburg. Barely more than two hours later, 
W.B. Allsworth arrived at the community of Richburg and by direct wire over the telephone asked Hattiesburg Mayor D.D. McDonald for help. By 5.30, the smoke and cinders of the great shiny black Baldwin steam locomotive smelled the lobby of the depot at Hattiesburg as slowly and deliberately the vehicle of hope gained momentum for its journey of mercy to the south. Several physicians, dozens of nurses, and other volunteers from the Gulf and Ship Island Hospital and the South Mississippi Infirmary in Hattiesburg packed the train with emergency food and other provisions. The enormous coal black cloud had boiled and rolled, then bounced down off the heavens, first smashing into the J.W. Treen home before slashing straight through the center of town. Treen, whose grandson David would later become governor of Louisiana, was along with the rest of his family fortunately only slightly injured. Such was not the same fate for two of Purvis's best and brightest, Clara Weems and Gertrude Bright, who were preparing to perform at the school program that evening. Instead, the young girls' bodies were placed to rest in a makeshift coffin next to the dozens of other victims that lie dead nearby. And of when a weary may we be so blessed and sink like the innocent child to rest and feel ourselves clasped to the infinite breast. Among the saddest of scenes was of the funeral train as it idled next to the remnants of the depot. There in a lonely boxcar, Bertie Mae Vowell, 11 years old, calls softly for her mother who had been instantly killed by flying debris. Little Bertie Mae lingered deliriously for a while before passing away that next hour. Cold in the dust, the Finnish heart may die, but that which wounded it once can never die. But now they sleep, where daisies nod, and clover hangs its head, where the wild birds come, and the wild bees hum, above their lonely bed. They fought the fight, they kept the faith, their form shines bright and clear. And their memory lives in all our hearts, which will hold them ever dear. Jerry Palmer recalls his grandmother, Eula, telling it this way. Your grandfather, Edward, and our three boys, Henry, Elmer, and Ernest, and my sister-in-law, Annie Woods, and her family, Roderick, Sam, and Eva, we all took shelter in a house on Mitchell Avenue. We all huddled in the hall, and I was holding baby Ernest in my arms. As the storm approached, it became almost as dark as night, and the house started coming apart like it was exploding. The wood hit me and the baby directly. I had but a broken shoulder. My nine-month-old baby was dead. We thought Sam Woods to be dead. Eula, Henry, and Elmore, they were taken to Hattiesburg on a special train for the injured. Among the family's hardest hit was Sam Woodbury's. Woodbury and six of his children were killed instantly by the storm. Sam Woods, who would later grow up to become American Council General to Zurich and serve his country by playing a central role in the exposure of the development of nuclear weapons by Nazi Germany, was thought to be dead in the aftermath. He was laid to rest under a sheet while the wounded were tended to, to be miraculously revived by the lingering drops of rain that dripped upon his brow in the wake of the storm. I reckon that we wondered to the Lord what we do. They came and dug this great big trench at the cemetery, and they laid all them poor folks in there together. We didn't have nothing more than one room shacks for our own, and there wasn't much left on our side of town. Hazel Pilot Reynolds, nine years old on the day that the tornado came calling, remembers it this way. My double first cousin, Yuba Pilot, who was 10 at the time, and I were walking home from the graduation exercises. We could see a really dark storm cloud southwest of town. It started raining and then we heard a sound like a freight train coming. And men started hollering, it's a cyclone, it's a cyclone. I got to the house and daddy told us to go to the center of the house. We could see two funnel clouds coming out of the sky. The two merged into one funnel. We were on the bed and my grandmother said, don't raise up, something could come through the window and kill you. The storm picked up our house and turned it around. 
The door that was facing west now faced east. We did not get hurt, but every other house on our block was flattened and people were blown away. Some were found later, three to four miles out of town. Preston Higginbotham, in his early 20s, was working down at the New Orleans and Northeastern Depot that afternoon. The tonnage of the cargo was no match for the storm. I tell you, I was unloading coal that day down there at the railroad depot in Purvis. The vacuum, I guess, just picked up the coal car and turned it right on over. I was able to get loose and hang on to a telephone pole till it was all over. With the threat of famine and disease drawing near, the hundreds of wounded and fatherless, and the thousands of helpless and homeless, more help was desperately needed. Within days, Congress had appropriated relief funds and assigned the United States Army to take control of the ravaged area. The first of many relief trains left the nation's capital under the charge of Major Duvall, who arrived and organized temporary shelter for those in need. Downtown area was as wide as a cotton field with the rows of pitch cloth tents sent from afar. The town is practically destroyed. The dead list is between 55 and 60. 200 are disabled, 2,000 are homeless. 70% of the residences are totally destroyed. Every business, house, bank, the mills, almost all completely destroyed. Every church, all public school buildings, the Masonic and Pythian halls, all are destroyed. The incredible unexpected blow of the tornado of 1908 was blunted somewhat in the ensuing days and weeks after the storm. Just as personal articles such as a journal from Purvis were blown as far as Shabuda and Waynesboro, and cotton bale tags from Franklinton were found months later in Purvis, so too did much needed assistance of all kinds breeze in from all over the country. Governmental agencies, private businesses, and the likes of the United States Surgeon General's Office, the Red Cross, and the National Guard, among others, all came to the rescue of the people of Purvis. To the east of town in neighboring Forest County, Luther Williams recalled being glad to find at least one thing. My house was wrecked by the storm and my belongings scattered to the winds. I had two trunks in my home that were full of different material. Of the trunks and the contents, I found nothing except in my garden. From one trunk, a bottle of liquor, sticking topside up in the mud. Nearby, a glass from the other trunk. A century later, the effects of the Great Purvis Tornado are still felt. Gone now are many of the landmarks of that day, such as the great clock which was perched atop the cupola of the courthouse, stopped at exactly 2.13. The sounds of the whistle and hisses of the steam engines and sawmills have been replaced by the smoke and roar of the diesel electric trains on the New Orleans and Northeastern. Newer buildings of brick and mortar now rest more strongly on the foundations of the heart pine stores and houses of Purvis before the cyclone, or B.C., as the old-timers would refer to it. I am Dr. Karen Socher lundy from the University of Southern Mississippi School of Nursing. When the tornado of 1908 struck Purvis, the American Red Cross had just undertaken its first major campaign to recruit and enroll disaster nurses nationally for disasters such as the Purvis tornado. That event provided a field test of the newly developed communication system. As a result, 17 staff nurses and head nurses were assigned to the disaster at Purvis from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. These nurses managed tent hospitals in Hattiesburg and coordinated disaster relief for three weeks after the storm. Although the nurses worked hard, the recruitment and securing of new nurses within the system had been less satisfactory. As a result, the American Red Cross staff had difficulty locating the enrolled nurses and in the end had to recruit unenrolled volunteer nurses from outside the system within the local community. The disaster drew attention to the need for a more collaborative effort between nursing organizations and the Red Cross to develop a network of disaster preparedness through local volunteer nurses. This early field test during the tornado of 1908 gave the American Red Cross a blueprint from which they could work to develop the present communication system in which we locate and place disaster trained nurses in times of disaster. 
The legacy of the tornado of 1908 is found in the state of readiness of the city a century later. That storm, along with more recent similar events at the Lamar County communities of Olo, Pine Grove, Summerall, and Hickory Grove, spawned a heightened interest in the people of the county to be prepared for future events. Tornado shelters are being constructed. A siren warning system is being developed and will soon give warning of severe weather systems that threaten the area. And first responders are well trained for such a case. In the 21st century, Purvis once again is a proud, small city and county seat, standing its ground with a solid economic forecast, low crime and unemployment. Many of the community leaders are descendants of the victims of the tornado of 1908, and today they pass down the same stories they were told as children. The old growth timber is gone, replaced by plantation forests, which supply the lumber yard adjacent to the New Orleans and Northeastern, across from the site of the old hand sawmill number two. Today, the people of Purvis look to the future, only now with wistful thoughts of the past and that fateful day in April. They also watch more closely the southwestern horizon, especially in the springtime, when the memories of another time are rekindled with the blooming of the dogwoods, that special time when the wild birds come and the wild bees hum. <laughs>